So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Chen Zhen Yu. Um, he's a PhD candidate at the University of Rochester. His advice is uh, Jebo. You know, a lot of us know Jebo. Uh, Chen Zhen, I think he did a really wonderful job for his PhD. Uh, he's going to finish really soon. Um, he's focused on this for social media analysis. That's one of the works he did on the social media analysis. Uh, today he's going to talk about the sentiment and the emotion analysis of uh, social media. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction. So yeah, today I'm going to focus on this uh, topic. It's kind of my sixth topic, uh, sentiment and emotion analysis. Then if we got time, I'm also going to go through some of the other projects I've been working on. Okay. So first, uh, uh, so just to use this picture, maybe a lot of people have seen this picture, you know, user generated multimedia content from all different uh, platforms. So just means there's a lot of a huge amount of data generated every minute in the web. So, and also there's a lot of open APIs from such as Twitter, Instagram, Flickr. The problem is how can you use data? How can you use it? What kind of application can you use them? So I'll start with the first uh, research project. This is back in 2012. It's indeed my first research project in URR with Professor J. Bolo. So at that time, I think you know, the, one of the most uh, very interesting topics is the presidential election in 2012. Uh, indeed, we are also working on that uh, problem. It's kind of a uh, prediction problem. We want to predict the, the supporting rate from both candidates. Okay. And it's a, kind of like a time theory uh, prediction because you have a supporting rate from many different polls, also have many different uh, uh, signal from the website. Here are the two pictures, for example, the two curves show the, the image uploaded to Flickr, uh, which contained Obama or Romney. So there's just one signal, and uh, one of the, uh, the signal we think is the most important is uh, opinions, people's uh, opinions about sentiment towards these two candidates, right? It's also a time, time theory change. You can just uh, analyze the content from each day. Then you can have many signals, then you can use the vector auto regression. And at that time, and then we just uh, focus on the data source is the image, right? And uh, we all know people's opinion when you upload the image. So it's very, very difficult at that time because it's a kind of like a new problem, and no one has been focused on that one. So what we did is just you know, detect the face and then try to use the facial key points and build a classifier for the two candidates. And to build the training data, we just manually label them. Here are some students in the university and then label them and then train the classifier. And from this project, we just realized, well, this could be a challenge you know, to do the sentiment analysis. So we have been writing some proposal and get some funding from this project called the Social Media Sensors. And typically, so there's a lot of uh, different topics on this figure. As you can show on the red part, there are three uh, topics, the text sentiment analysis, the visual sentiment analysis, and joint sentiment analysis. This is just to try to analyze on the generated content. And then to check the two are going to be the main topic I'm going to ta talk about today. And on the, right part, on the left part, uh, there's many applications and, the, and many students in our lab who have been working use a social multimedia data source to do those kind of applications such as user profiling means you don't build the demographic or user interest for the certain network users just based on their content. Or the check the ones are just uh, some more project I've been working on or involved in. And if we got time, maybe we can have brief uh, go through that kind of applications. So let's uh, start with the sentiment analysis, the definition. You know, Definition is just identify and extract the subjective information in source materials. This is a definition. And uh, indeed, for tactile sentiment analysis, there have been many related works or related projects on this topic. And uh, especially in the time of deep learning era, and uh, there are some people have developed the recur recursive neural network or convolution neural network or some unsupervised uh, learning framework for the task, such as Dr. Work or Skip Salt. And uh, on the other hand, uh, for visual sentiment analysis, which can be defined as uh, the perceived uh, emotional response when you saw that picture, which has uh, been a relatively new topic, and uh, there's a uh, very limited work on this topic. 
when we started this project. So, uh, but due to you know the success of deep learning, especially the convolution neural network on computer region, I think uh, this could make this task kind of possible to solve at least to get some good performance. Okay. So I have a question. Okay. All sentiment is subjective. Yes, exactly. But subjective information is not sentiment, right? Yes. So how do you define sentiment exactly? So okay. So the question is how do you define the sentiment exactly? So that I think uh, for for visual part, we are just defines uh, your perceived response, sentiment response, your brain response when you saw that picture. But for text, I think you also have this kind of similar definition. You just uh, your emotional response when you read that sentence. It means uh, it's kind of like a higher level response from your brain than uh, object recognition. Yeah. Okay, so we start with uh, uh, today. I'm doing the first uh, introduce two project on using uh, visual and text sentiment analysis. I'm going to because there's a kind of two. This example shows us uh, the, the data we have. Normally we have a picture, we have a, a text. Okay, so the, the goal of this uh, joint sentiment analysis is going to build a joint model, try to model the sentiment with the paired data. Okay, that's, uh, because that's uh, the two focus project I'm going to talk about. The first one we propose is called cross-modality consistent regression. So we have an assumption. And the assumption mean, uh, is that the visual content and textual con description can be sim similar sentiment. Or given a pair of data, we have this assumption, and based on this assumption, we define our learning objective, which is uh, to make sure that uh, the different modality features agree with each other on this prediction task. That's uh, the goal. The, to formalize into this kind of equations, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the objective function. And uh, the D here is a uh, KL divergence. We're trying to enforce that uh, the distribution on the sentiment from different uh, data source can agree with each other. And we also have some regularizers. Then, based on this framework, uh, you can use gradient descent and to train and learn the model. So here the C, the M is a number of modalities, but in our case it's just uh, two modalities, right? Just the uh, text or image, and uh, the N is the number of training samples in our data, and uh, the first uh, term is the uh, character divergence between the ground truth label and uh, the concatenated features of two modality, and the last uh, character divergence term is uh, the consistent between each individual modality and the concatenated, concatenated uh, feature. Okay. That's an uh, intuitive goal and based on this, uh, just based on uh, start from the assumption we made. Okay. Each modality should have a distribution or a similar distribution on the final task. And uh, because of, as I said, this is kind of pretty new task, so one of the challenges or difficulty when, on this task is uh, data. So when we want to train a deep learning model, I think we need a lot of well-labeled data sets. That's a challenge here. And uh, we... Could you go back what the C stands for? Oh, C is the concatenated feature. Because we just concatenate each uh, multiple in modality into a vector. And then instead of make the pairwise uh, KL divergence between each pair of in, uh, modality, we just make them to concatenate it. So to make them consistent with the concatenated feature. Yeah, that's, that's what the last term. Because uh, we think, you know, if you make a pairwise uh, consistency in the enforcement, then you will have maybe uh, a lot of term in that one. Here, it's just M modality, just uh, the same with uh, do you, M. Do you train the weights for each different uh, that's a good question, yeah. The question is, uh, do you train the each, individu each individual modality? So in this work, uh, and, uh, because we focus on this uh, kind of loss, we didn't uh, train those kind of each individual modality. It's just a fixed. For the visual part, we used uh, pre the pre-trained uh, convolutional network to extract the visual features. But for the text part, we trained our own uh, feature Extractor. It's used the uh, document to vector. So basically, the goal is to 
uh, transform each individual sentence or each individual paragraph into a feature actor. That's similar to a doc, uh, to a word to actor, but here the input is a sentence or a paragraph. Yeah. So the gamma m is the weight, right? That's the modality. Huh? Yeah, gamma is the weight. Yeah, this parameter tuned uses some validating data. Yeah, it's uh, hand tuned. Yeah, hand tuned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but for after you get the uh, feature, I didn't change the each underlying module. It's uh, just a fix a feature character. So the first one to build this data set, and uh, because we inspired from some previous work, which kind of build this kind of data set. It's like a trade-off solution. It's not a perfect solution. You know, instead of manually label data, you just have some keywords. These keywords are from some psychology study, and each each word we're going to have some sentiment, such as positive or negative. Then you use this as keywords to query some websites, and you assume that the return the data is going to have that kind of sentiment. That's an assumption, yeah. And uh, this has been used uh, widely on this kind of task, you know, subjective task, because you don't have a ground truth um, label. And uh, this one data set we build from the Getty image, because the Getty image is kind of very clean data source, and because they have very uh, clean text, uh, very clean keywords, and uh, the quality of the image is also very good. Compared with the social, other social multimedia data set. We also have another data set that's uh, built from Twitter, which is a query using Twitter streaming API. And, but we filter to only keep those kind of English words and only have both image and text. The, the, but for this tweet, uh, because we don't have this kind of keywords, so the solution is uh, we use the existing tool, which is uh, some manually designed rule based, just based on rule instead of a content. We use that as a label. When we keep those kind of top ranked samples as positive example in our data set. Okay. Because it's rule based and our method is content based, we think this kind of can be used as a tool to just label, manual label. They treated that as a ground truth. And the finally, we also manual label a very small data set. It's uh, using MIT, MD McKinnon Turk. It's about 2,000 paired image tweets, and ask a worker to label them. Each, each sample will assign five workers, and then in the end, we'll keep at least four or five agrees on that pair of data. We just use that as a, a, as a testing case, a small testing data to see the performance of the model trained on the large scale weekly labeled data set. Suppose, uh, sorry, so okay. when people post a tweet, Assume that other people will respond. Do you use those texts? Oh uh, no, we didn't use the text. We just use the original. Original one. Yeah, original one. Yeah. Sorry. So this is for the testing purpose. Yes. How many? How many workers? Five. Oh, five workers mm -hmm. for each Im each Im image. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And for the labeling here. Okay. Uh, people only look at the image, right? Not the not the text. Okay, so the question is for the labeling task, uh, does the worker look at both the image or just look at the image or the text? Okay, so we just uh, give them both the image and uh, the text to ask them to read the text as well as see the picture to, to give uh, overall sentiment. Yeah. But when you do the labeling by yourself or by ourselves, maybe people only look at the image. Yes, that's a good question. Yeah, so we just uh, do some random checking on the quality of the data, and uh, indeed, uh, uh, I think if you only we we have some uh, some examples uh, try to get some qualification test first before you take our task on the on this kind of sentiment analysis. So I think for those kind of qualification tests, it's manually designed by us. So some of the examples that we just designed, maybe the sentiment that comes from text part. If you see the picture, it's kind of neutral. So if you just look at the picture, if you take text, I think you, you may fail that case. Well, the yeah. easiest would be to kind of blur out the text. So you have two control versions. One is basically with text, and, and the other one, the text is blurred out, and see what the responses are. So then you know if the text has a very significant impact. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so the suggestion is here is a 
to evaluate uh, the performance of seeing just the text and seeing the paired image and text. Oh, well, I think that's a good suggestion, yeah. That, in that way, you can see the response, yeah. But here, oh, I didn't do yeah, that so way. For yeah. the first example, if I look at the image, probably I would think it's a positive, right? Yes. People celebrating like, something. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Can you know the flag? I don't. I, I don't. Can you see know the expression? The expression. Can you see the expression here if you look closely? Yeah, they're probably happy. They're happy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Thanks. So actually, but uh, so a related question, maybe I kind of was going to save it for later. Um. So you have all these. Do, do the rules that you're applying in the other stage for capturing the data capture things like sarcasm? No. Okay. Because particularly on social media, I think a lot of the posts are sarcastic. Right. Like you see the abandoned car. Right. Like, you know, this is awesome. Right. <laughs> and it's like, you know. Yeah, sarcasm is a very challenging problem in sentiment <laughs> analysis. Yeah. I know that. yeah. So here's the performance, and uh, yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of results. I know you showed one. It's, uh, this one is on the weekly label, the image twist. I think our performance is uh, kind of much better compared with uh, some baselines, which is text and visual only, and uh, early fusion and late fusion. So and uh, along with this line, we developed a second one. This uh, picture shows the motivation. Uh, because previously we just focused on the objective function, right? So here we just want to design a much robust model to learn the features. So this is just for, for, uh, for motivation purpose only, okay? We have a picture, we have a, a tweet, right? And we can see that the loss of corresponding with the different region in that image and the other one with some of the words in that tweet, right? So our goal is to use this kind of corresponding to learn a robust uh, representation from this pair of data and use that representation to finish the final uh, sentiment cut. Yeah. yeah. Before we go to that one, so on the, the previous slide. Sure. Uh, so this is the profile. What's the human performance in this? Because it's like a binary classification. Okay, so for human performance, uh, I didn't uh, measure that one. But uh, what's the proposal to do the five people you, you showed earlier? The, you want to do with this data? Okay, also use this as a evaluation task. We also have this kind of table I didn't show here. The, the, uh, yeah, the, evalu the performance on this uh, kind of data. I think the five is just because if three say one thing, two say the other thing, you just discard that. Yeah, exactly. That's just for testing, yeah. So I want to keep at least four people agree on that sentiment, on that pair of data. You are not using that data to do the, the ground truth. So you must use something do something, I don't know. No, that's, that's the ground truth. So that's the ground, ground truth. truth is from text. That's my understanding. Yeah, that's weekly label data set. We have two Twitter data set. The okay. second one is very small. So this one. This one is only for test only. For test purpose, yeah. Yes, it's for test. Yeah. Where is the result? Uh, I, I didn't show it here. Okay. Yeah, you have a similar table. So the result for the uh, manually labeled data image trace also have a similar performance table, uh, but I didn't show here in the slides. Yeah. So I thought this was the performance on the labeled data on the text. training on the weekly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So weekly labeled maybe it's easier, right? Because it's more extreme cases. So the question is: uh, weekly labeled uh, image. So it's more easy or compare, easier compared with uh, manual label. Yeah. Uh, but I think uh, after I check the data set for the manual label data set, I think for the manual label ones maybe kind of easier because there are kind of always some kind of very easily identified cases. Because people uh, agree on that one, yeah. On that. Yeah. So yeah, especially if you only test on those kind of at least five people agree on that. Uh, those kind of cases, the performance is better than you test on both fourth and five agreements. Yeah, because this kind of thing has some extreme cases. Uh, that's why it's make it easier. Yeah. Because actually, it would be interesting to see a graph that shows the frequency of agreement, like for each tweet, like 
four is for one and that's one person. In other words, how many of those tweets where everybody agrees on, how many of those tweets, you know, only one disagree, mm -hmm. only two disagree, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. That would have been interesting to see also. Okay, yeah. Whether you have that kind of data. Yeah. I ha well, in my paper, I have a table yeah. to show those result, prediction results on those kind of, at least the three agree, four agree, and five agree. But uh, I didn't show, okay. yeah, yeah. So that's the second one, yeah, just mo this motivation. So to solve this problem, we use a trace value STM. So we start from a tree, tree is semantic parsing tree from some text. So given each sentence, they use some tool, you can build a semantic parsing tree. And the right part is a tree structure. And uh, you can, each internal node is an STM cell, assuming just a, a variant of R recurring neural network. And each leaf node is one keyword, one word from a sentence. And given this tree structure, we want to build a robust uh, feature implementation. Because, but uh, our case here, we want to use both the image and text, right? So we focus on this uh, leaf node. Leaf node, we want to uh, use the image and the keyword as input and try to identify, um, weakly identify the relevant image regions. And then use this uh, to generate uh, uh, output for the in, for the leaf node, and the leaf node is going to give the output to its parent node, and then you recursively with it for the past information until you get a root node, which is going to be the global representation for the tree. And uh, so to map the keyword with uh, the image, here we borrow the uh, idea from a previous study on uh, image caption. So basically, you use the convolution neural network. You can think of the convolution operation as some uh, local operator on different regions of the image. For example, here we use a VGG as a, as a underlying uh, convolution neural network architecture, and then the convolution layer, the last convolution layer, which is a 14, 16 by 16 uh, output, we can uh, upsample this one to the original image to, to kind of map that to different parts in the image. So we use that as a feature representation for each region, which uh, yeah. Then use the word representation as an input for the word, uh, representative for the word. Then we use the attention model, try to find the attention weights from different uh, parts in the image. Then you generate uh, the output. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm trying to understand this model. So the, the input, do you give attention over various image regions? Yes, okay, so the question is uh, where does the attention come from? So I have, for each leaf node, I have one word. Uh, word is from the tree itself, and uh, also the image. And uh, for the image, we use a convolution layer from the VGG net. It's uh, used as, uh, think of that as a different uh, feature from a different region in that image. Because if you do an image region proposal, I think it's a very time consuming and uh, almost impossible to train on this large scale data. So we just use that strategy, only focus on the, the 196 regions, which is 16 by 16. You can think of the 16 by 16 grid on the image, but it's not a grid, it's a kind of overlapped grid. Yeah, think of that a 16 by 16 grid on the image. We just try to find, the, given this kind of word, we're trying to find the correspond relevance of different regions with this word. To represent the word, we use the word vector, and different region of the image represent use a convolution features. Yeah. So the, the word input to this network? Right? Yeah, the word, word here. The word is uh, here, T. T is just uh, that uh, WI is a representation. WI is the word in that leaf node. When we came back, in previous slides, you know, for example, each tree is going to have a word. So the T like the embedding? Yeah, the, the, the embedding of the word, yeah. Thanks. So the training framework will look like this. The input is one image and the parent sentence. And uh, the second part is use the uh, image to go to the through the convolution network to correct the features. And uh, the third part is uh, the tree structure, the LSTM based on the parsing tree, and the, the last part is sentiment classifier. Yeah. This is an overall framework. You can train from yeah, end to end. Like. 
And uh, but when we are doing this kind of work, we think it, uh, it's very challenging to find uh, the correct correspondence between different words and the local region, right? It's a very challenging task. And because uh, you want to find you know, different uh, data from a different semantic space, you want to match them. So, but this, we also see some previous work, for example, this one of the previous work, uh, deep visual uh, semantic embedding model, which try to find uh, in the, a model which uh, find the correspondence uh, between the word and the image content to learn some semantic uh, embedding objective function. So basically, it's a it's like a margin-based uh, ranking loss function here, and also this one is based on sentence sentence level. Okay, well, sentence and the image you want to run uh, to learn the semantic uh, similarity between each input sentence and e each input uh, image. So inspired by this kind of work, we also uh, add this to our framework. We use that as a additional task. Okay. So the, now the training formula look like this. So it's a two-task learning. So margin ranking based loss the help us to learn the semantic meaning between the words and the image. Basically, it help us learn good attention model. Okay. And uh, uh, the soft max classifier is uh, the, the sentiment classifier. So when you train this model, we have two pairs of data. Why is the correct pair? As you can see from TM and VM. We just think of the image T is a sentence, and uh, the red part is a TM and a VN. So, for each pair, each sentence, uh, a pair of image and a image, image and a sentence, we just randomly pick another training image from the data set, which is different from the current image. So we make the wrong pair. So the margin ranking law, so it's basically say, well, so for this wrong pair, it should have a smaller similarity compared with the correct pair. So that's uh, the margin ranking loss. That's our goal. But if you do it randomly, if you happen to pick something that's actually appropriate, then you're going to get into trouble, right? Yes, that's possible. Exactly. Yeah, that's possible. But uh, since we have very large uh, training data set, I think uh, maybe that can elevate that kind of problem. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the performance is pretty good, I think, on this one, uh, compared with the previous results uh, using the same data set. These things, uh, yeah, the means you know when you focus on feature part, it can significantly improve the performance. And uh, this one data set, the Getty image, also the visual sentiment ontology, which is another data set built on Columbia University. And we also evaluate on the same data set. It all shows much better results. Then LSTM attention just shows the uh, result as a margin ranking based on loss as a second task. Now the last one is uh, using both the, as a training objective. Here's some, we can also visualize where the attention comes from. Uh, we compare these two parts. For example, the left one shows the LSTM embedding. This one maybe, you know, different word can find uh, some very small, relative small regions. And for the right part, if you result the guidance from the margin ranking based loss, I think uh, most time the attention just uh, maybe attend a very huge amount of area, which is maybe not good. And by the way, I want to mention that for some words, for example, all, they, is, you know, this kind of words, I mean, does not make sense to us, especially when you want to map, mapping this word to the image, right? Does not make sense. There are no corresponding regions in the image to this kind of abstract words. But I think because we are using the LSTM styles in the internal nodes, in the tree structure. Now, every time we want to forward the path back, uh, pass the information to this parent node, I think the LSTM cell is going to learn to try to remember something that's relevant to the final task, which is the sentiment classification, or which one is not relevant. So it cannot rem forget some information or remember some information. That's why the intuition here, maybe those kind of words can also have some correspondence here, and this is shown in this picture. But eventually, the LSTM cell in the internal nodes in our tree kind of forget this information. And uh, that's why they still can have good performance in the final task. So, yeah. so I, I try to understand the assumption. So your assumption is each region will correspond to a word? Yes. And the set correspondence will always be the same, same uh, location? Not the same location. Yeah, the, the location, the candidate location is fixed. You just want to 
find the most uh, relevant or uh, distribute the different uh, weights among these candidate uh, regions. Yeah, you can think of that way. So, okay, so, so given the image, I mean, in the test case, right, you have an image, have, te have a sentence. So your res you, you, at the end of your, your output will be like for every word in the sentence, you will, you will, you will create this sort of a, a map, like this hidden map, which indicates for this, for this particular word, where the region, where the pixels will reflect on this word. Is that what you, what's the, what your output is? Okay, so the question is, uh, so in the testing case, uh, the, is this picture shows the output of the, yeah. the, the model. Now, this, uh, this output is uh, just for uh, demonstration purpose only. So when I debug the system, this also help me to find the, the how does this uh, correspondence. Yeah. yeah. I, nobody would know what this is supposed to be. I mean, yeah. like life and love. Where is but for the... <laughs> but, 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 but do you feel it's, 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 it makes sense or not? Makes sense. Yeah, some words make sense to me, yeah. I mean, if you show for an attention model, if you debug attention model, if you show some picture on the right part, so each word kind of uh, attention with uh, the almost evenly distribution among different areas, Sounds that's really always easy. means your attention model is not working. That's what I mean so we for mean the part. pay attention to regarding that word. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking that when I look at your picture, right, and the picture here says love, for example, even look at the word love. Yeah. I, I was thinking that oh, love, maybe some of, some, of, some of the pixels reflect the love strong, more strongly than some other pixels. Yeah. Like, I would expect that like, the, the face of the, yeah. the girl maybe reflect the love more, so, but I don't see the strong... Uh, yeah, there's a little bit, yeah, a little bit, uh, also the hand. And the hands and the face, yeah. The hands, yeah. yeah. The hands some, yeah. So, yeah, know, that's a. I, so it looks like the. I mean, the 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 hidden map does not exactly. It's not what I ex, I, I expected. I guess. The, I think maybe this uh, this case maybe this law could be because you know when you're trying to learn the correspondence between law and some different region in an image, right. and a lot of training samples in the in, in our data set, there may be some hand in the in the data set. In those sentences, uh, image pairs, when there is a uh, love, there will always maybe a hand in the picture, some shake hands or hug each other. Or That's why maybe there is a high response in the hand part, especially if you want those kind of touch something. Do you use color in the, do you use your image color just black and white? Can you tell me, can you say the images, hmm? you use just the color, or just the color, black color, color image, or black white color image. Yeah, color image. Only, I, I think only the content word, like the meaning, life, and love, may contribute to your task, right? The the of is seems to not contribute. Yeah. So, not related uh, yeah. to the sentence. Yeah. So the question is, uh, why do we, why you use all the words, right? Just uh, maybe classify different words. Well, that's a good suggestion. You know, indeed, we we saw that one. That could be a uh, uh, indeed we discuss with a lot of people and uh, some some people from NLP background. They they can think. You know, first you can build some some part of speed tag on this word. Maybe you can, uh, yeah, as you suggested, and get rid of this kind of functional words. Maybe just focus on the, uh, some verbs, some, some adjective word, ad adjectives in the sentence. We can all think of that, but uh, indeed we also have an idea, you know, we can you know, assign different uh, uh, LCM cells LCM to those kind of different uh, types of words. But uh, since the performance looks pretty good, <laughs> that's why we didn't try that. We think that could possibly Im further improve the performance. But that's a good suggestion, yeah. Indeed, from the very beginning, we cannot uh, notice that. And also, as I explained, uh, I hope that the STM cell can learn which, which kind of pairs, which kind of correspondence maybe contribute more to the final task, yeah. So for an uh, example, if you have a dog running on a grass, yeah. so one, late, one sentence could be a dog running on a grass. Then you will see the distribution of the words over the space. But someone can also give a description like beautiful. And where this beautiful will be associated on this picture, the dog could be beautiful. 
the grass could be good too. Yeah. So, so this really depends on the, how the people describe the picture, right? Exactly. That. So the question is, uh, or the suggestion is, uh, the attention model depends on how the people describe the same picture. Yeah. And uh, I think that's true. You know, if you choose different words, you can have a different distribution on the same picture. But uh, since we have a lot of data set, I'll uh, assume that uh, this kind of attention model depends on the frequency of the words in our training data set. Maybe more frequent words will have a better chance to find the, the more relevant uh, image. For example, maybe for the beautiful, if there's another example, example, if there's another example, someone has uh, killed a dog, and he would just, uh, this is my cute dog, or this is my beautiful dog. This will have a beautiful end of the dog, both in this pair of data. Maybe some other examples, uh, maybe someone takes a picture of a park, you see there is a beautiful grass, and you know, this kind of corresponds between beautiful and grass. If you have those kind of, both cases, have those kind of training samples in our training data, then there is a high probability that in this example you just mentioned, uh, there, the model is going to find the, the both the dog and the grass is going to correspond to the beautiful world here. Yeah. But if, if we do not have this kind of training sample, I think uh, maybe it's low probability we will find those kind of correspondence. Yeah. Can you go back to the, sorry, the results table? Yeah, yeah, here. So, I mean, there was, I mean, the interesting thing is that the, so far, every example you've talked about, I feel like you could just get it from the text. Life and love are clearly the positive sentence. You don't need the picture. But like the gain is huge when you add the visual. So I guess can you just intuitively what are some examples of cases where the visual is really helping? I mean, I can make them up my head, but I'm just. I was going to ask that question too. Because because it's, yeah. like, it's helping. I mean, you get 20 points of precision and 20 points of that yeah. one, but I can't think of any. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When does image actually help? Wow, that's a good suggestion. So the question is. Uh, can, do you have some samples why you know image helps? Well, I didn't have those kind of samples to be honest. But uh, I can talk about it more maybe on the visual part. Okay. Yeah, further. So this is just uh, you know I want to first talk about these two projects on both text and, and image. But look, indeed before we start doing this, we first started doing visual sentiment only. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well, this is the first project we have been working on using image only. So we just predict the sentiment distribution on the image, because, uh, uh, yeah, the when think about sentiment analysis, I think one of the main uh, domain people can think of it maybe from the comments or reviews from some product, right? Such as Amazon or Best Buy, you can always see the reviews. Then you can see the sentiment. That's, that's where I think uh, it's very easy to explain text sentiment to people. But when you think about like, visual sentiment analysis or image sentiment uh, analysis, there's no such domain, right? There's no good domain, and people are uh, very hard to imagine those kind of domain, where the sentiment uh, come from, from the image. That's why you know, it's very challenging, I think, at the first when you try to uh, uh, formally or good define this problem, or at least they have some good uh, training samples for this problem. So uh, that's why we, when we started this project, uh, it's uh, the first part is building a data set, which is, uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, from Visual Sentiment Ontology. It's a big project, a research project from Columbia University. They have built such kind of data set. This has been a huge amount of effort in building this kind of data set, which is only involve image, and each image is going to have a, a sentiment. But uh, the sentiment is weak. It's not manually labeled, so when we train on this problem, we, that's why we call it the progressive training at the end. So we have this kind of iteration, which uh, first uh, we, uh, we go through one, step one, two, three, and four. So basically it's just training one, condition the work based on the input and the label. Then you just sample on those training samples. It's kind of like the bagging, right? And well, we want to reduce the variance. So after sampling, we are going to use the sample training data to fine-tune the neural network gain. 
So this sampling function uh, have this property, which you know, for the model is very confident of the current prediction, with a high probability it's going to remain in the training data set in the next round of iteration. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the intuition. And uh, we, because this project is pretty old in 2014, I think at that time our results showed uh, uh, pretty good compared with some low level features and uh, some middle level representations. Also, uh, a same condition in our results is kind of progressive training the strategy. Uh, and back to your question, maybe you know, think of what kind of those problems uh, where you know the sentence may the image may contribute more. I think maybe from those kind of top uh, examples, if people choose a kind of neutral uh, description, they kind of this visual part may contribute them more. But uh, I didn't choose the kind of example, though. If you get a chance, I can show you from the training data. Yeah. Okay. So that's just for sentiment, but for emotion in data, that's, uh, uh, we, all, uh, we also have this project. One question yeah. before I go to emotion. So, that, so I want to uh, understand this a little more detail. For example, uh, once you give an image, an image you can consider that uh, uh, entropy over the sentiment. Yes. Right. So some image, the entropy may vary, uh, peak on some specific stuff. Right. But some images like very flat entropy over all kinds of the sentiments. Okay. So for the very flat entropy stuff, your sentiment prediction may not be very well. Yes. And now you add a tax on top of that. Basically, you narrow, you narrow down the direction for the sentiment. Basically, you give a direction for people to consume this picture. Then, if that text makes sense, then the text plus image can help you to predict the sentiment more accurately. But if the Twitter on that image also several tweeters together have a high entropy over the multiple sentiments, mm -hmm. then for that image plus text, you still may not have a good result. Right? So yeah. the reason you can have better result because the text narrow down the scope over the sentiment give you a way to have a better prediction. Is this understanding correct or not? Yeah, I think that's uh, so. The the question here or the argument here is that the text or uh, the description for the image is going to narrow down the direction where we are going to find the sentiment on the image. Well, I think uh, that's uh, possibly true because. Uh, for a lot of image, I think maybe it's not containing any sentiment at all. And it's the same for the text. A lot of documents, for example, Wikipedia documents, there are no sentiment at all. Only those kind of sentiment related sentences or text can lead to some direction, at least for, for example, for text sentiment analysis. And along with the image, maybe you are right, or maybe for some image, some kind of image, people are going to choose the kind of sentimental related sentences. That's why uh, it's possible an like, argument to maybe right here. And sentiment uh, of the image is uh, limited by the distribution of the sentiment on the text. Yeah. So the next part. So if you go back here. Okay, uh, here. Here, yeah. Uh, go back to the original earlier. Uh, earlier yeah. This one. This one, right? Yeah. So, so when you try to do the fine tuning, you see, okay, if you have a output for a particular word sentiment, then you try to reinforce in some sense. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so in your in your test set, you throw away all the not confident one. No, no, no. Do you, you don't I still keep it. those one. Yeah. You also keep the. Yeah. So how do you measure the precision then if it's very low? So for this one, I, uh, indeed, if it's not confident, that's not me, I throw it away. If it's not confident, I still have some probability that I keep that in a 
know, yeah. but when you do, do the evaluation. Okay, do the evaluation, I uh, keep, uh, I still use a weak label as a ground truth for the testing data set, yeah. Because they have a label, right? They have a label, yeah. yeah. But the label is not uh, uh, consistent. Uh, so may not, but I don't. I just use that as a testing case. I didn't. Did, did. So, so for example, if if an image they have five uh, liters, right? And all five. Oh, okay. They don't disagree with so, each other. Okay, that's Do you think good. Is that is there in the in the test set or is through the database? So the question is, uh, are we going to keep uh, all, data. yeah for yeah. the testing data set? Yeah. So for this uh, framework, we have two t testing data. First one from the weekly label the testing data set. Mm -hmm. The second one is the strongly manually labeled one by yeah. us. So for the weekly label one, it's the uh, original build by this uh, VS, uh, Visual Sentiment Ontology. Mm -hmm. It's a zero data set. So we just keep that one. We didn't touch them. Mm -hmm. So for the manual label one, only keep those four and five agrees. The same strategy, yeah. Yeah, so, so if, if in that case, if you test with that data, of course, you will get better result. If you reinforce, you know, only for the consistent one. But for the test case, we didn't show anyone. We just time, Treat them the uh, same. No, no, in, the, in your test data set. Yeah. You only. We use the final model. The after several iterations, we use the final model to uh, to just uh, test on the testing data set, it, to use that as a ground, as a prediction results for the testing data set. Compare with the ground truth, which is the yeah, but your weak ground truth is only. Weak only. No, no, your ground truth. I, my understanding is your ground truth only contains. Uh, strongly consistent. Uh, uh, that's uh, the second testing data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only for testing only. We didn't use that for training. I understand. Yeah. But uh, if you measure on this highly consistent data set, of course you will get better results. Yeah, yeah. I, I see what you mean. Yeah. But uh, that's uh, fair for all the testing algorithms because we are testing on the same data set. I think it's a kind of fair comparison. Okay. Thanks. So. so this project for visual emotion analysis because for sentiment it kind of has a positive and neutral and negative or positive and neutral or positive and negative. So for emotion it's a fine green a sentiment and maybe have many different categories. Uh, this picture just shows some of the re uh, embedding results for our color data set. So our data set uh, computer in this work is trying to build a large scale emotion analysis data set. Okay, so before so the main contribution is building the data set. And uh, first, we use some, uh, uh, some keywords, query different platform, and build a wiki label data set. Then we use uh, Amazon Machine Turk to label them. Because at first, we are very ambitious when build, because it's kind of running out of time, so I'm just speeding a little bit up. So the first, we call the dumb data set, and then we use uh, Amazon Machine Learning Worker to verify them. And uh, at first, I want to build a half million image, but uh, it's uh, turned out to be very expensive. So in the end, we only have this kind of data set. For each e uh, emotion, we have at least uh, 11,000 uh, images submitted to the Amazon Micron Turk. And uh, we only keep four and five agreements. And uh, the, sec the third row shows the left in examples. Then we use this as a ground truth. And uh, because on this uh, study, for previous study, there's a very limited data set which only contains uh, hundreds of images. And people have started working on this data set for a very long time. So we think maybe we can build a relatively large data set that related to the community and people can benefit from this data set. And uh, uh, yeah, compared with this data set, I think our data set is uh, large enough compared with them. Uh, we compare with a lot of previous studies on this uh, data set using uh, the, a different model, where, which we have different uh, variants of the convolution neural network. The last three one, image analysis, noise fine tuning, which is fine tuning on the uh, weak label data set, and the last one fine tuning the uh, fine tuning on the manual label data set. So uh, overall, I think uh, uh, the results show the better performance compared with the previous result. And uh, this data is publicly available, so people can download and uh, continue the study on this topic. And uh, another one, last one on this visual sentiment analysis, uh, it's uh, uh, trying to first uh, localize, localize the region, then focus on that region for sentiment analysis. So again, the goal, the motivation is to use the attention model, but here we use just one attribute instead of a sentence, just one attribute of word, 
find the attribute word to the different local regions and uh, find the most relevant one, use that as a feature to predict the sentiment. So we have uh, this framework, the uh, B part, visual attribute detector, which is going to detect uh, one attribute or uh, uh, some candidate attribute from the image. And uh, the D part is going to use that as uh, the input to find the relevant uh, regions. In the end, you build a classification model. We first test this uh, on the Oracle visual attribute, which shows a very good results, especially the attention model. And uh, I think I learned a very good results on using just uh, those kind of uh, attributes. Some angry, for example, abandoned, those kind of adjectives from the uh, 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 visual ontology data set. And uh, for the visual attribute detector, I think uh, we didn't spend a very much effort on this. Uh, this side, we just uh, used uh, uh, a simple predefined VGG net and then defined uh, 32 attributes. And top one accuracy shows about 28%. Compared with uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, paper, which is the ACM Multimedia 16, they have focused on this kind of uh, attribute detection, I think uh, our results should compare our results a little bit lower than that, but that's not a focus. We just use that uh, low performed uh, visual attribute detector, try to learn the final classification model. Okay, And uh, the results shows uh, here, the table shows that it's comparable with using a global, global feature repetition of the image using the local ones. And uh, if we in incorporate both local and the global reputation, we think it can further improve the performance. That will be another project on a, uh, for another member in our lab who's uh, been working on that. And uh, one of the main reasons to use the attributes that we assume that the attribute detector should not be perfect because, for example, this picture, we may have detected awesome or beautiful or amazing. I mean, it's not, it could not be accurate. Any one of them is fine, right? Awesome or beautiful is fine. As long as it's kind of positive, then we can use them to find some uh, good candidate regions and then build a good classification model. That's why we use this manually replace the incorrect attributes to some level of percentage or accuracy percentage. Then we can see the performance of sentiment classifier is also increased with the manually created, we call it a manually created visual attributes. So basically, because we don't have a good uh, attribute detector, we just manually want to improve the attributes detection and uh, the, the can eventually improve the performance of sentiment classification. Okay, so that's basically some of our projects that we're working on sentiment uh, analysis. And all, uh, we also have an hour, so I'm going to talk about some of our projects. It's not uh, in this category, but uh, I've been working on in the past uh, several years. Okay. So the first one will be in here when I uh, did an internship here with John Chrome in 2013. Uh, we, are, we are working on, on very interesting projects. It's using geotech tweets for navigation. So the left figure shows some of the uh, tweets from the user. So basically we connected uh, the consecutive tweets from each user, connected them and show the overall uh, distribution maybe from a lot of users. Then you can see the kind of very good results with the road network, right? So this motivates, uh, motivates us to the problem of how we can use this kind of information for navigation. Just without the road network, we only have those kind of geolocations and at the time you post that tweet and the geolocation. That's the only information we use. I want to uh, find a navigation system. So to solve this problem, first we divide the, uh, the map into many different small uh, triangles. And uh, you just, uh, we try to, for any starting point, ending point, we try to find a, a path, or plan a path for this kind of starting point, ending point. And in this way, we can build a navigation system, right? So the challenge here is shown in the left figure. So given one pair of data, how you are going to estimate the probability probability between any pair of small segments, any pair of starting any point in a small segment. And uh, the left figure shows uh, we use uh, the Brownian bridge density function, which is going to, for example, we have a pair of Twitter from 
x a x y a a here is a uh, one the starting point for that pair of tests, and the end point of test is a uh, y x b y b and t. We have time, we have starting point, and ending point. Then we kind of use this information kind of predict uh, estimate the probability the user when he goes through a to b the probability of the, he goes through some of small segment small segments in the triangles, and uh, which is x a Y the X two Y two here. I uh, use a uh, burning bridge model. You can estimate uh, all this kind of distribution over all small segments on the triangles. If you aggregate all those kind of probabilities over all users, all his uh, parallel twists, then you can estimate the distribution over all the segments over all the map. Then for any starting point, any point on the red figure, you can see you just uh, use we use a star algorithm to kind of find uh, the optimal. Pass just based on the probability of jumping to the each neighboring points on the triangle, then you can build this kind of network. And the one interesting problem is that we, if you use different twists at a different time, for example, we use a twist only on weekend or only on a rush hour, then we can now have different paths compared. Uh, yeah, and uh, we have this example when you indeed uh, go through the the actual pass and I think mo this is a very good result because at that time, at rush hour, I think uh, if you go through the what's that, the highway above, maybe there's uh, always some traffic jam over there. Yeah, we check, I'm going to check this one example. What's the, uh, I'm trying to understand the motivation for this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good uh, question. So the question, like I can't understand that. Like I say, okay, we don't have navigation, but I can't understand where you'd have not have navigation and have a lot of tweets. Okay, the question: What's the motivation uh, motivation for this project? Yeah, India, that's a very good question because when we submitted this work to some uh, peer reviewer conference, and a lot of people reviewer also asked us some question. We have a very good commercial navigation system. Why should we use this kind of information, right? Uh, well, I think this is just uh, maybe. Uh, suggesting that this kind of information can be integrated into the current uh, system to improve the performance. But for this kind of as a standalone application, it may not be very useful for real app, real navigation system. Yeah, this just want to show that this kind of information is very helpful. If you want to build for navigation task. Yeah. Probably it can be used to predict the accidents. You know, <laughs> Okay. So another project is on user profiling. So we want to build a user profile. This is an intern work I want to do at the Xerox or uh, Park East, uh, Park Research East. So the, uh, this is uh, an uh, uh, intern project. And the first one is a very quick one. We want to quickly build a target uh, project on predict the gender just based on the content. From uh, Here we use the Pinterest uh, data. So based on the pin board's content, can predict this user is a uh, male or female user. Right? And uh, uh, we achieved about 70%. I think it's uh, comparable with uh, some existing work, which is just about analyze their content or text only. So the gender of a person who posts his picture? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It seems a very uh, easy question, but it right. turned out to be pretty challenging. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this uh, results me seventy percent comparable with uh, only use the text on some other existing works. And uh, we also have this uh, fine grain user interest predictions on the same internship. Uh, this interest uh, is uh, based on the pinboard categories we, because we we use this way to build a ground truth. Each pinboard uh, will have uh, some ground truth. Which uh, we use that as a uh, distribution. That's a ground truth for that pin, pin, all the images in the pin board. And uh, in this way, uh, the, the initial goal is uh, you know, using this kind of model, we can build some prediction model right, uh, on these categories. Then for another user, maybe from Twitter or from Instagram, then you just grab all their posted image, then you predict the distribution or the, or the 
interest that we define. Uh, maybe you can find uh, the most uh, relevant interest for that user. That's where you go. Yeah. Okay. So, a uh, third one is on uh, Adobe Research is on image captioning. Uh, we use uh, data released by Microsoft Research is a uh, Coco challenge, right? Uh, our this figure shows the overall idea. So, given this picture, we want to first detect some low level. Uh, but uh, this, this, this detects some relevant uh, keywords to that image. And uh, then we generate the sentence on that image or the description on that image. We try to use that uh, uh, words as guidance to generate the next uh, word. That's the uh, initial goal. So uh, in one word, we try to focus, use the very successful object detection or the keyword detection task to help to generate a more difficult task which is generate a sentence right because for the first one we think it's uh, have pretty Should good I, performance could you explain what's the graph with you uh, the graph is the distribution of the uh, ways of the candidate ways when you generate uh, the sentence for example uh, for we we when you generate a next word uh, of mind writing a way a way we going to have a large uh, attention weights Graph showing the attention weights. Yeah. Attention weights on where? On the uh, ten, uh, uh, 10 keywords. On 10 keywords. Yeah, we have 10 keywords. So at each step, you will have a distribution on these 10 keywords. Yeah, so this is a visualize of the 10 words distribution attention weights on this every step of the recurrent neural network. Yeah, so I have more detail I can show you in the last figure. So this is just a one. Based on we built install or use an attention model, which is a concatenate the attributes of keywords at each step in the recurrent neural network. It's a baseline. And uh, here is the attention model, it actually works. So we have uh, attributes of 1, 2, 3, and uh, indeed we have 10. Now at each step, uh, you try to use the either the current word or the hidden state. We have two attention mechanisms. One is using the current input word. Another one is using the hidden state to find the most relevant keywords. Use that to generate a context vector. It's going to help to, to predict the next word, or predict the distribution of the next word. That's, uh, that's the objective, yeah. And uh, the, another question is how you build those kind of visual attributes or candidate kind of words, right? We have a different, uh, we choose a different approach because it's not a I mean contribution. We, for example, we use the KN, K nearest neighbor, which means you find the, for each testing image, you find the, the most similar image in the training data set. Because the training data set is going to have captions, then we have, that's the frequencies on different words, then we use that top frequent words to add the uh, word uh, attributes for the current image. And the uh, multi level ranking just build uh, uh, another. Uh, a model to use this as a multi-level classification task to predict the top-ranked uh, keywords. FCN is indeed built by Microsoft Research, and uh, because they all, you also have the image caption system, I think the first step is to detect those attributes or detect those keywords, then to compose them into some sentence. So FCN is the first step. There's a pre-trained model. We use that as, a, as another baseline to detect the visual attributes. Here's a performance. Uh, uh, last row shows, uh, for example, the second one, I think uh, uh, previously uh, a lot of systems will detect those as a uh, baby eating a piece of paper or a baby holding a, a baseball uh, racket. But uh, here, because we can easily detect the teeth or the brush, or toothbrush, so it uh, kind of helps the model to, to realize, well, this is a uh, to sparse instead of um, uh, paper or instead of racket. Okay. So at that time when we submit the work, we think uh, it's ranked uh, first uh, in the leading board okay, in, in 2016. Yeah. And uh, the last one is uh, what I did in, in Facebook and uh, culture dynamics and trends in Facebook photographies. So we want to analyze uh, by just analyze people's content, their encounter, we focus on the image. We want to learn 
what's the difference before, uh, between two people from different countries with different backgrounds, cultural backgrounds? What, what kind of patterns can we discover? Uh, indeed, I think this is kind of more close to a data analytics task or project. But uh, all the signals in this project come from a computer vision model, which is going to predict uh, the concepts we are interested in on each image or all the images posted by all the Facebook users. So we have a lot of results. I think uh, maybe uh, some of the uh, patterns, the seasonal patterns, some is uh, some uh, continually increasing patterns, uh, continually decreasing patterns, and uh, also some concepts such as smile or uh, hard working, those kind of, you can see, you know, for example, uh, one developed, one funding is that for developed countries, people, maybe they have a concept more related to family and children. And for developing countries, maybe people are more low uh, selfie, a lot of selfies for developing countries, at least for, for Facebook users. And uh, also for this kind of daily, daily pattern, it's kind of, you can see the different uh, uh, concepts uh, change with the, over time of the day. Uh, we also have some, uh, com you can compare this kind of concept from different countries, from the UK and the US, and then you can see some difference. And uh, there's also special and temporal change, some concepts distributed in more popular across different countries compared with other countries. And uh, if we use some this kind of distribution or the concept of the repetition for the country, then we can you know, embed in the country into the semantic space. This is just one example, embedding, uh, if we choose different countries uh, and different uh, time window, we can see, uh, find a more interesting pattern. I think normally uh, the results are is that uh, US, UK, or developed country, Western country, European country cannot have a close uh, cluster compared with some Asian countries or some Arabian countries, okay. And the last one. What are these plots? Excuse me? What are the figures I, I don't? See this picture? So I can put that one or the other one. Okay, the, the left one shows uh, the concept uh, that changes over uh, different countries as well as over time. For example, uh, swimming, yeah, the A and B swimming, you can see swimming is pretty popular in the summer of the north uh, hemisphere of the Earth, and the, but it turned out to be pretty popular in the summer, in the win winter in the no north, in the south. Yeah, this just uh, this is obvious, right? And this figure on the right. The right is want to compare or to evaluate what's this impact of the countries. For example, or what are the axis? Uh, there is no no mean on the access. It's because it's use the in embedding. You don't know the mean of the access or y access. Yeah. So we, for example, uh, HK here or Japan is here and the uh, US and uh, uh, all this area. Maybe some of the European countries they cannot cluster here. Why they cluster here? Because they have a similar distribution over the, uh, the concepts that we defined. We, use the, we have 1,000 uh, concepts. That distribution of the 1,000 concepts from all the users in that country, we use that as a feature representation for that country. This 14 means we use the year 14 the data. 15 means we use all the data from year 15. Yeah. yeah. Do you learn anything which is not very obvious? Uh, maybe the, uh, okay. So another result is based on this kind of distribution. We built uh, some, uh, some regression model which trying to uh, analyze uh, the contributing factor to this kind of similarity between different countries. And uh, our, or maybe that can also be obvious, maybe the education level or the income it's strongly correlated with this kind of similarity. But uh, that not obvious one maybe come from the, this slide here. It's uh, the friendship between different users on Facebook can be attributed to homophily or can, can be attributed to some propagation. 
OK. By a uh, diffusion, called diffusion or homophily. Diffusion means uh, you are influenced by uh, uh, your your friends, and then you choose to post uh, some similar contents. But a homophily means you, if you post uh, this content, it's due to your own interest instead of some influence from uh, your friends. So here, uh, we want to see, we want to use some, this, this result, just one result, use a shuffle test. The left figure shows some of the top confidence, some of the top confident examples that you are easily influenced by your uh, friends. For example, when your friend posts the uh, uh, image containing face or person or children, it's a high probability maybe you go to the same party or same uh, hangout, then you cannot post the same, same picture, right? And uh, this is influenced by your friends. And uh, on the right part, it shows some of the concepts uh, which are mainly due to your, uh, your own interest. Uh, indeed, there are some of the con top con examples is some weapon-related concepts. So maybe this uh, is kind of interesting, not due to your friends, right? You are interested in guns. It's a dangerous weapon, maybe mainly due to your own interest. And this kind of discovery, I think it's uh, uh, kind of related to Facebook. Indeed, they can use this to uh, help their advertisement strategy, maybe. For example, for the left concept, because this is due to friend influence, right? Influence by a friend. So if we want to post the uh, advertisement contains those kind of concepts, then we may only focus on those top influential users, right? If, that, if this user is a very influential user, and uh, it, uh, it, uh, you just advertise this kind of concept on this user, this user can easily influence his friends because it's an influential user, right? It's more effective for the advertisement. But for those kind of concepts on the right part, which is uh, mainly due to the homophily, which means uh, you cannot analyze the, the relationship between different uh, users. More important thing is uh, you analyze their content. You try to discover their own interest to find if this uh, particular concept, this user is interested in this concept, then you target your advertisement on these users whose uh, content that may be related to this concept. Yeah, that uh, maybe could uh, the only benefit for Facebook from this project. Yeah. So do you feel like uh, the results are consistent with uh, your intuitive observations? Yeah, for the right part, we think it's uh, kind of... Uh, you think it makes sense? Like yeah, it makes sense. I thought like uh, cosmetics, if uh, one girl use this, and she will have friends who also want to use it, right? Yeah, that's also true, yeah. <laughs> but for... I'm not sure what's the shuffle and what original? What, what purpose is that? Okay, so, okay, the question is what's a shuffle or what's a original, okay. So because we are, we are using a shuffle test, uh, the shuffle test we're trying to find out uh, whether or not this concept is due to your influence, is influenced by our friends. So the assumption here is that if you are not influenced by your friends, so I just shuffle the timestamp of your friend's image or content, you are still have the same probability of post the same content, right? For example, if your friend post a party in yesterday, maybe you are going to the same party, or you see your friend post a party, so you also choose to post the picture related to that party. If the assumption that you are not influenced by a friend to post this picture, that means I change your friend's timestamp of posting that image to a later time, maybe next week, then you are still have the same probability of posting that picture on this today. That's uh, the, the motivation of shuffle test. That's what I mean, the shuffle. So using the original data and the shuffle data, you kind of have some uh, Correlation coefficients, which is shown in the number here, the difference shows uh, it's a if a large the difference correlation made. Correlation between what and what? The difference between the no, coefficient. The, the correlation, the, 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 the two columns. Okay, so if you have a uh, data, you have a lot of stamps, uh, so you just uh, use a uh, uh, regression model try to estimate uh, the probability of posting the data, posting that content on the same day. Correlation. Yeah, some regression model. Between friends or the picture? 
Yeah, some regression model, yeah, coefficient model from a very simple regression model. So not a very and complicated are, linear regression model. Friends, yeah. And uh, he looked at the collision of my face images and the office images. What's the correlation between the two? In, in, in time sequence. This time sequence. Time sequence, yeah, time sequence. So different shows uh, the kind of influence of biofriends. The difference in large means you are influenced uh, by a friend. Uh, original is just uh, original time sequence. Uh, original time the sequence. Very first, this uh, shuffle is the repost. Uh, I just randomly change their timestamps. So you change the timestamps. Uh, uh, I manually randomly change their timestamps, or, or posting a particular content. <laughs> yeah, I can talk to you later. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that will be the talk today. This is all the uh, mentors. Maybe I have been working on during my internship in the PhD. And uh, thanks a lot for showing up and attend my presentation. Yeah. If you have any questions, we can still discuss here. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. thanks.